On the order paper question nine has been asked by the Honorable K.R.J. Mishwe. Mr. President. Honorable Speaker and Honorable Members, since the outbreak of the coronavirus pandemic in our country in March of last year, more than 82,000 people are known to have succumbed to the disease in our country. And more nearly 2.8 million people are known to have been infected. This virus has caused massive damage to the economy. It has disrupted education and increased levels of poverty and unemployment. When combined with other preventative measures, such as mask wearing and social distancing, the COVID-19 vaccine is the most effective instrument that we have to prevent deaths, reduce infections, and restore the economic and social life of our country. Evidence shows that COVID-19 vaccines reduce the chances of severe disease, hospitalization, and death. Madam Speaker, as I said in February of this year, no one should be forced to be vaccinated. Instead, we need to use the available scientific evidence to encourage, repeat, encourage people to be vaccinated, to protect themselves, but also to protect people around them. At the same time, our occupational health and safety laws require that we ensure a safe working environment. This situation poses challenges for employers who want to keep their workers safe from COVID-19 while respecting the rights of those who don't want to be vaccinated. On the, sec on the 11th of June this year, the Department of Employment and Labor issued consolidated directions on occupational health and safety measures in terms of the disaster management regulations. The directions provide guidelines for employers that intend to make vaccination mandatory. Such employers need to determine the category of employees to be vaccinated, taking into account the vulnerability of employees owing to age or any comorbidities that they may have, as well as the risks that are posed as a result of the role of the employee, that the, the work that they do. The implementation of any mandatory vaccination policies must in the end be based on mutual respect which is the respect of the rights of the people, which achieves a balance between public health imperatives, the constitutional rights of employees, and the efficient operation of the employer's business. Now, that is quite a delicate balance that needs to be struck. Employees may refuse vaccination on medical or constitutional grounds. In such instances, the employer should cancel the employee and if requested, allow them to seek guidance from a health and safety representative or a worker representative or trade union official, as well as a health practitioner. If necessary, steps should be taken to responsibly accommodate the employee in a position that does not require the employee to be vaccinated. And it could range from either the employee can continue to work at home without contact with others or customers or suppliers or whoever, or to be placed in an area where they are able not to interface with others to spread a virus. On the question of tenants being forced to take vaccines or risk losing their accommodation, like any other person, tenants 
have a right to decide whether they should be vaccinated or not. Getting vaccinated is not only a personal choice, Madam Speaker, about protecting yourself from infection. It is also about protecting others, including one's own family, friends, co-workers, and allowing the whole of society to return to normal activity more quickly. If we can vaccinate a large enough proportion of our population, particularly the adult population by December, we can avoid another devastating wave of infections and restrictions on the economy. Those who refuse to be vaccinated are increasing the risks for all of us, not only of a further resurgence of infections, but of prolonged economic hardship and lack of recovery. We therefore all have a responsibility to encourage all South Africans over the age of 18 to go to their nearest vaccination sites today to protect themselves, to protect others, and to help all of us get our economy back on track. Above all, vaccines are free in our country. They are safe and they are effective. I thank you, Honorable Speaker. Mr. President, the first supplementary question will be asked by the Honorable K.R.J. Mishwe. Mr. Mishwe is here in the chamber. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Honorable President, for your reply. God, the Almighty, has given his people the right to choose. That is now being taken away through totalitarian governments around the world. A righteous and just God who wants all to be saved does not force his salvation on anyone. Yet, imagine dictators are trying to force people to receive vaccines they don't want to. This, we believe, is tinary that must be resisted by the people of the world. Section 12, subsection 2C of the South African Constitution says, and I quote, everyone has the right to bodily and psychological integrity, which includes the right not to be subjected to medical or scientific experiments without their informed choices, close quote. My question to you, Mr. President, is whether you are willing to help prevent a new form of apartheid where unvaccinated people are being discriminated against and excluded from some places, and whether you are willing to defend the, un the constitutional rights of South Africans whose choice is not to be vaccinated. The ACDP says no to a new form of apartheid based on proposed mandatory vaccination, which is against the South African constitution that is held by many around the world. Just to remind, to remind members that one reason why the South African constitution has been hailed all over the world is because of the right to choose that the South Africans have been given. Thank you. The Honorable the President, Thank you, Honorable Speaker. Honorable Meshwe is absolutely right. Our constitution, as he says in section 12.2.c, does give everyone in our country their rights in terms of their bodies and all that. The answer I gave to Honorable Meshwe's question earlier would address precisely this. And I have said, nobody in the end should be compelled to be vaccinated. There are quite a number of companies that have now said that vaccination is mandatory and they are also subjecting themselves to the directives that have been issued by the Department of Labor and Employment and have said, that yes, they recognize that workers, their workers have their constitutional rights, but they are also saying that they also have the responsibility to protect other workers 
against infection. In the end, Honorable Mishra, you will all you will also agree with me that the rights that are in our constitution are not absolute rights. They are rights that have to be exercised with due consideration to how those rights affect the overall rights of all of us. When we imposed a lockdown in March of last year, we knew very well that we were curtailing the rights of movement, the right of assembly of everyone in our country. And all of us agreed that that was the right thing to do because we were safeguarding the population of our country against widespread infection. And as it turned out, it did prove empirically and otherwise to have been the right step to have taken because we did at that stage level off the incidence of infections. <clears throat> and through that, we saved many lives. I can say that many more South Africans would have died. And it was incumbent on the government to embark on this drastic action that led to the curtailment of the rights of all of us, starting with me as president and everyone else. Why did we do that? We did that to save lives. And similarly, the issue of vaccination or not vaccination has to be looked at in that context as well. We are saying vaccination has been proven, or vaccines have been proven to have a very positive effect in saving lives and reducing uh, infection if it has set into anybody's body to a point where their lives will be saved. And it is for this reason that we are saying, we would like to encourage everyone in our country to be vaccinated. And I do not buy into the notion that this is being done by authoritarian, dictatorial governments around the world to force people uh, to, to, to be vaccinated. And if we do not take steps to encourage and get people to be vaccinated so that we can have what they call herd immunity, what I call population immunity. Our health services could be overrun and we've seen that whenever we had had spikes in infections. And we've curtailed certain rights, including alcohol usage, movement and all that. Recognizing that people have rights to be able to imbibe alcohol, to go wherever they want, but we curtail them for that moment and say, it is important that we should save lives. Now, the directives that have been issued by the Department of Labor take into account a number of conditionalities or set out a number of conditionalities. And these are very much in line with our constitutional architecture, that we've got to respect the rights of others, but at the same time in ensuring that the rights of the entire population are also upheld. There are various steps that we need to take. And this is precisely what we are also saying to various companies, that if you should encounter a situation where certain workers don't want to be vaccinated, there are various steps that you need to take, at, uh, in, um, respecting their rights, but also dealing with them in a humane manner, uh, hoping that they will be encouraged in the end to be vaccinated so that they can save the lives of their own families as well as the lives of their co-workers. And this is the approach that is given rise by the constitutional architecture we have. It sets out rights, but those rights also have to be balanced with the rights of the overall community of South Africans. And in that balance, we would find that there's a good way forward to enable us to save the lives of our people. Thank you, Honorable Speaker.